Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, the 26th of June, 2018, just after one o'clock. Welcome to the UK Column News. Your host today, Mike Robinson, myself, Brian Gerrish. And before we go any further, you should be aware, of course, that today it is yellow alert. Uh, temperatures are rising. The British government feels that it's vital to warn people that the sun is shining so that, of course, you can take appropriate action, which I believe is run, hide, tell. Yes, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Yes. OK. And uh, on that subject, uh, let's move straight over uh, to the OPCW because they are in special session today, a uh, special session called by the UK. Uh, Boris Johnson is even there in person today. Fantastic. So uh, they're going to, well, apparently they're going to unveil the long expected uh, report into the alleged chlorine gas attack uh, in Douma uh, a few months ago, if you remember, the one that didn't happen. Uh, that's likely to happen this afternoon. But anyway, Boris Johnson was there. Uh, well, why? As we can see here, we need this meeting, he said, to reaffirm and defend the ban on chemical weapons, especially following the pro poisoning of Sergei and Yulia Skripal in Salisbury in March. Uh, that's uh, the missing Sergei and Yulia Skripal, uh, the two that haven't been seen for quite some time and aren't likely to be ever seen again. Uh, but what's this meeting really about? It's not really about the Skripals. Uh, it's following on from Theresa May's comments at the G7 summit a few weeks ago, if you remember. She said at this summit, we have discussed a range of issues, foreign interference in our democratic institutions and processes and other forms of malign state activity pose a strategic threat to our shared values and interests. And she said today, uh, G7 leaders agree to establish a new rapid response mechanism. And of course, one of the uh, rapid responses uh, that she was talking about was the ability to uh, attribute uh, blame for certain events, uh, whether there's any evidence for it or not. Uh, not only attribute blame for certain events, but to have uh, a single narrative across all the G7 nations. Uh, and she said that the OPCW in particular should be given uh, extra powers to attribute blame, uh, whether there's evidence or not. So that's what Boris Johnson is attempting to do uh, in uh, Geneva today with the OPCW. Uh, and of course, uh, the Russians uh, have said this. Uh, of course, we're ready to counter Britain's initiative. Uh, I believe there'll be a serious discussion of the solution proposed by the UK and expect other draft decisions to be uh, to be submitted. Uh, and uh, well, we wait to see what the outcome of this is. Uh, but frankly, this uh, rapid response mechanism, uh, along with the fusion doctrine, uh, continues to uh, well move us towards some kind of fascist dictatorship, as far as I can see, where there is no sense of uh you know proof that somebody is required you know any level of proof that somebody is guilty of something no presumption of innocence it's very simple if the government um puts its view forward then the view of the government becomes the truth you should believe that truth and if you don't then you're a rebel you're a domestic um extremist and uh, the government is is going to crush you this is where it's is going very rapidly now mike and of course hand in glove, we've got the general suppression of free media because nobody must have an opinion which is different from the government. The government doesn't le need evidence in any way. Um, while you were making that report, I noticed that somebody in our chat box um, has just posted that apparently on ITV, um, it's being reported that Salisbury homes that have apparently been poisoned um, are being bought um, for sums totaling a million pounds. So. I presume this is to help the street theatre that the contamination is so bad it's gone into some people's homes. The government is going to step in and buy those homes, uh, creating the evidence. Oh, I think that's fantastic. That's that is uh, that's a precedent being set there. So whenever the uh, fracking really kicks off around the countryside and people's homes are being uh, potentially destroyed as that. The government will that, purchase will those undoubtedly homes. Undoubtedly purchase those homes as well. OK, well, that's, that's a precedent being set. Uh, now, yesterday we mentioned that, uh, of course, uh, there's a defence and foreign ministers meeting, a joint meeting uh, in, in Brussels uh, for the European Union. And we showed what uh, Federica Mogherini was saying uh, with regards to that. Uh, that meeting obviously took place and certain things were agreed. So let's have a look and see uh, what she said at lunchtime. Uh, first of all, we took important decisions uh, to advance our EU defence work in preparation for the European Council. We adopted uh, uh, the uh, rules for the governance of the permanent structure cooperation projects. 
So now the focus will be uh, fully on the implementation of the 17 projects already existing, the preparation of the new set of projects to be adopted by November, and the work will start to prepare the conditions for third countries' participation to PESCO projects. Now, what was particularly important about that, of course, Brian, was uh, they're moving ahead with PESCO, as they said they would be, uh, and that's all fantastic. Uh, but you'll notice at the end of what she said there uh, that she's particularly interested in how third countries will interface uh, with PESCO, and of course, that's with reference to the United Kingdom. Uh, and uh, well, uh, we mentioned yesterday that Freddie Howe, was, uh, who's the Defence Minister, uh, was in uh, on that meeting yesterday. And it seems that uh, it wasn't just PESCO that's being discussed. It wasn't just EU-NATO relations uh, that were being discussed. Uh, but of course, uh, what seems to have come out of that is a new agreement, not, not a bilateral agreement this time, uh, but several countries, uh, France, Germany, Belgium, Denmark, Estonia, the Netherlands, Spain, Portugal, and the United Kingdom have signed a letter of intent supporting a multinational alliance. Uh, and this is apparently to make sure that Britain can stay involved with EU defence uh, once we leave the European Union. Uh, that's what they're saying. Uh, this is clearly an initiative that allows the association of some non-EU states, uh, said the French Minister and uh, the French Defence Minister, and uh, the UK has been very keen because it wants to maintain cooperation with Europe beyond bilateral ties. Well, I think this is one of the points that we've been making very strongly for quite yeah. some time. Um, so... Uh, that's fantastic. Uh, what can we say? Well, I, I think one of the things we could say, Mike, and again, another comment that came up earlier with it, the picture of Theresa May there, she's looking extremely tired and drawn. I think a lot of pressure coming on Theresa May as she's told what she will be doing next. And I, I see the same with um, Frederica Mogherini. She's looking haggard, lots of makeup on, looking tired. The pressure is really on now of the uh, supranational EU state to get itself formulated with this unified military structure and the Treasury, of course. Absolutely. And as we mentioned uh, yesterday, they also agreed the next steps on the military mobility action plan, which, again, part of EU military unification. Uh, and uh, that's all about making sure that the, the so-called military Schengen, that uh, uh, arms and material and, and men can move from one side of Europe to the other uh, with no uh, barriers to cross borders and so on. But, Brian, uh, what was quite amusing uh, was that while this was all going on, uh, the Defence Committee uh, has published this document, Indispensable Allies, US, NATO and UK Defence Relations. Uh, this is an attempt to raise military spending to 3% of GDP. It falls on from the furor over the weekend with Gavin Williamson claiming that he was going to bring down Theresa May's government unless she agreed to this. Uh, but I just thought the timing was hugely significant uh, because they've decided because, you know, the BBC, uh, sorry, the, the BBC and other UK media focusing on this issue and pretty much ignoring what was going on in Europe yesterday. Uh, I think I saw uh, the what was going on in Europe yesterday covered in the Express to some degree, uh, not in its entirety, uh, but not really for anywhere else. They were all focusing on this. And this is Defence uh, Select Committee. Uh, saying that, uh, you know, we've got to increase spending, that they're wanting 3% of GDP to be spent, uh, that a rise to 2.5%, however, would comfortably fill the black hole in the existing Ministry of Defence budget. Uh, the report says the government uh, must not uh, allow the UK's uh, usefulness to the United States to diminish. They can't allow that to happen. You can't put the special relationship at risk. Uh, and Madeleine Moon, who's, the, uh, uh, who's on the committee, Labour MP for Bridge End, a friend of ours, I believe. Or not. Yes. Uh, uh, said that uh, the UK's armed forces have been hollowed out. Is that not a word that you used? It was, Mike. Yes. Or fairly regularly. Uh, and that the Navy was very weak and that air capability was diminished. Uh, but don't worry, influence is really important because unless you can back it up with capability, you have no credibility. So, so yeah. we're going we're so, to need to spend more. Uh, and that was uh, Madeleine Moon's professional opinion as a um, long-standing social worker, of course. Yes, indeed. Uh, but presumably it's people like Madeleine Moon that are bringing in the solutions to UK's uh, problems, military problems. And uh, we just thought we should bring this one on today to show where it's got to. Uh, but apparently it's being suggested that we should be using inflatable tanks uh, in a bid to confuse enemies on the battlefield. 
Now, the beauty of this story is that, of course, inflatable tanks were used with some considerable success as a decoy in the uh, lead up to the invasion of Europe. And they were there to uh, confuse photographic reconnaissance by the Luftwaffe, Luftwaffe. But now the idea is that we haven't got enough tanks. So we're going to use inflatable tanks in order to confuse those nasty Russians into thinking that we have more tanks than we really do. <laughs> um, this, is, this is real. Uh, let's remember that uh, we've got this illustrious man, the Minister of War, Gavin Williamson. And um, this is the state of Britain's armed forces at the moment. Now, I'd just like to say at this point, of course, we have to point a finger in several directions because uh, for at least 20 years, we've had exceptionally senior British military officers that have run away from politicians as the cuts have come into force. So we have to point a finger at the so-called gold braid in the military um, for not having the guts to stand up to the uh, politicians. We've got a program that's been brought in in order to decimate the military. So that's cuts in equipment, cuts in manpower, and general chaos in reorganization, future promises of growth, um, general chaos in the procurement system, and the running down of Britain's strategic industries, such as steel production, for example, and the production of armored vehicles ourselves. Mm. So all of that has gone on. Senior military people have said next to nothing. Uh, but of course, this is a planned action across the Labour Party and the Conservative Party, culminating in those dirty deals um, which were in the um, residence of the British ambassador in Paris, uh, facilitated by the charity, the Franco-British Council. So deliberate breakdown of the military. Now the public is told, well, don't worry, we're going to produce blow up tanks and we're going to spend more on the very chaos which is causing the problem in the first place. So this is an accidental policy. This is deliberate policy to confuse the nation and we have to see through it. One man who won't be seeing through it is local Conservative MP Gary Streeter. Uh, this is him in the um, Plymouth Herald. I think it was Friday, um, but he's, he's giving a warning that there's going to be a rebellion by um, Conservative MPs if the Conservative government un under Theresa May doesn't spend more on the shambles that is defence at the moment. And I'd just like to say the duplicity of this man is, is just astonishing uh, because, of course, he was a Remain voter, but now he's totally happy with Brexit. Well, he would be because there's no exit in the Brexit. Um, but he's fighting for defence after denying there was a defence problem, especially when the UK column warned him. And what did he do? He got personally abusive uh, with me on that subject and refused to have any discussion. And just so that uh, people know what we were talking about at the time, the Telegraph had quite correctly published a major story saying that the Ministry of Defence denies Britain's entire fleet of attack submarines are out of action. That was the situation. Mm. But uh, Gary Streeter said that we were simply talking nonsense. Now he's hopping in to say we should pour more money into this uh, shambles. Is it ignorance, do you think, Mike, or, or the lack of mental acumen he simply can't understand? No, I don't think it's even that. What is it then, do you I, think? I think he probably knows exactly what he's doing and he's just willing to uh, Stir mislead the and, and, uh, and so on. Yes. And help mislead the public. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, okay, a quick reminder, uh, AV9 DVDs, this is the last week that they're available at this price. Uh, they are available on the UK Column shop, um, so get yours now if you possibly can. Now, uh, this article was published last week, it passed us by, but I thought it's worthwhile uh, having a look at it because there have been some subsequent developments. Uh, so I chose the one from City AM, it got some reasonably widespread coverage in the British mainstream media. Explosive report published into Lloyd's handling of HBOS uh, Reading fraud case. Now, uh, we've been talking about Lloyd's and HBOS over the last couple of weeks because of the uh, comments being made by Noel Edmonds and, and the fact that he was trying to hold uh, HBOS to account and Lloyd's to account at the, uh, uh, at the annual general meeting. Um, but uh, this is a new report. Uh, it comes out of the uh, project Lord Turnbull report uh, and basically what happened was that the report last week was leaked 
Uh, it was leaked online uh, and uh, this caused pretty big embarrassment for uh, several people, lots of people, including uh, KPMG. So it, uh, the report, it, it is in a draft form, so it hasn't been published yet. So the draft was leaked and it alleges that there's been historic fraud at uh, HBOS Reading branch by senior management prior to the Lloyds takeover in 2008. Uh, and, uh, and so it goes on. But basically what's happened now is that the uh, Fair Business Banking, the all-party parliamentary group for Fair Business Banking has made some comment on this. Uh, they said that the report makes serious allegations against KPMG uh, and that the all-party parliamentary group will write to Steve, Stephen Hadrill, the chief executive officer uh, at the uh, uh, FRC, to press for new investigation into the KPMG audit of HBOS with regard to the Reading fraud in October, in, sorry, in February 2008, uh, which gave the bank a clean bill of health only two months before it hit financial difficulty. Uh, and uh, well, the KPMG themselves have clearly responded to this. They've said, we strongly refute the allegations in the report with regards to KPMG, which we believe to have no basis in fact. Prior to its publication, we had not seen the project uh, Lord Turnbull report and had, ha have had no involvement in its preparation. Uh, and uh, they said it's very concerning to us that such serious and defamatory allegations have been made in circumstances where the author of the report has not had the benefit of reviewing any of the relevant audit working papers. It's also unclear to what extent the report has taken into account uh, or has taken account of or accurately represented the relevant professional obligations of an, op an auditor. Uh, now, the uh, a previous uh, Parliamentary Commission on Banking Standards report had said that HBOS was carrying £47 billion pounds of losses uh, when it was bailed out by the government, uh, and that was despite having been given a clean bill, bill of health by KPMG. So, of course, bailed out by the taxpayer. Uh, and as uh, uh, So there's that on one side, and then there's also the fraud, uh, which uh, Noel Evans is trying to so hard to expose at the moment. So yeah. this situation just continues to build into a mess. Uh, and, uh, well, we look forward to see what comes next. Uh, I, just going back to the, uh, the all-parliamentary party group uh, on fair business banking, um, I am interested to notice that all the other uh, APPGs that I've noticed have websites which are uh, built upon the uh, the government platform, the government web platform. Uh, these guys have registered their own domain and set up their own website away from the parliamentary uh, website platform. And I just wonder, is there some, I'm just wondering what the reason for that is. Is there some, some difference between this particular all, parliament, or all party parliamentary group and others. Uh, I just wanted to, to mention that on the way and see if anybody has any any clues. Well, perhaps we could have a uh, perhaps we could ask our audience today to have a look into that one for us. Um, that would be very good if you can do some research to establish why this should be set up as a sort of separate separate uh, group of people. Mm. One could say independence. On the other hand, maybe they've moved away from government and a little bit closer to the banks. I just wanted to comment, Mike, that it's quite remarkable that, of course, that Turnbull report has come out of the reports of whistleblowers who have uh, blown um, what's happening, uh, what was happening in HBOS. And we know the fraud has happened because that's already uh, been fully and widely appointed. KPMG were the auditors. Uh, the fraud was not um, made public by KPMG, uh, but there's no problem and we should look at what KPMG have to say. Yes. I think there's, there's some wonderful media spin there from KPMG, but we'll see. Uh, let's change the subject and come on to children and i was just astonished to get this article through this morning um, somebody said i think you need to look at this the headline from the mail was child rapist who abused four children as young as eight enjoyed a day out to buckingham palace when his wife was given an mbe by prince william ian knight 55 who is a former soldier was found guilty of 10 sex offenses the Beast attended the palace with his wife, Major Pauline Murray Knight. Uh, celebrities such as Ed Sheeran and J.K. Rowling were also honoured. 
uh, Warwickshire Crown Court was told he raped an eight-year-old girl several times. Um, well, the first bit to say is that the response from the palace was no comment. Um, but I think um, that the Daily Mail hasn't been quite accurate with this story because if we have a look, it says this, following the palace trip in December, Knight of Nuneaton, Warwickshire, was jailed for 12 years in March. So the real question, was he out on bail when he attended the palace? And the Daily Mail doesn't answer that. The headline leads you to believe that a convicted sex offender was attending the palace when in fact, uh, that trial was in its early stages, or the, at least the police investigation. Um, however, it's fascinating, isn't it? Because apparently the um, lady in the picture there is involved with uh, counselling and questioning people who've been um, uh, sexually assaulted. So there's some... There's some pretty murky stuff There's going some on very, there. very murky stuff yeah. there. Well, if that's one problem for the palace, um, on Friday, uh, this was the headline, certainly everywhere in Plymouth, uh, which is that former Royal Navy Commander Charles Housen had been found guilty. Uh, he was sentenced to seven and a half years. This is for 10 offences, sexual assault offences, to eight young men. Um, it appeared in Plymouth. The BBC did carry it a little bit in the Daily Mail but the Daily Mail hasn't reported anything during the trial at all, Mike, which mm. I found rather interesting. Um, this was reported strongly by local papers, um, and this was his links through to the royal family. This man seemed to have an uncanny ability to call in high-level members of the royal family to support his various causes. And he seemed and to nobody... have uh, quite a few high-level people offering him character references at the court cases. Uh, I think there were 35 uh, in total, including polit or former politicians, admirals, lords. Uh, this was part of his defence, that he was such a wonderful, upstanding man, he couldn't possibly have committed these crimes. Uh, I think that leads us in nicely to what the judge had to say. Um, uh, let me read you through this and uh, we'll see why actually these things worked against him. Uh, you displayed the finest qualities of diplomacy, charisma, endeavour, organisation and charm, which you demonstrated during your period in the Navy and in your extensive and successful career and involvement at the very highest level with public bodies, authorities, businesses, including a bank, that was Coots Bank, but also in your public and charitable works, mainly associated with the community of Plymouth. And the judge went on, he said this, the hidden and dark truth is these same qualities were the very qualities which enabled you to mask and conceal a dark secret only revealed for the world to see some 30 years later in this trial. That secret was your uncontrolled and predatory sexual behavior towards particularly young or at least vulnerable men under your control. And I think that was a pretty important analysis because of course his defense had been on that he was so upstanding, he was so good at what he did in business and charities, he was untouchable. The judge seemed to see through that. But credit to this man, who's the local um, police uh, detective constable, Endicap, uh, who is the man who stayed on the, case, on the case with Mr. Housen and has ultimately been rewarded by this conviction. He said, these victims have waited a very long time for justice to be served. They have acted with dignity throughout the proceedings. The effects of Charles Housen's offending on them are lifelong lasting and it has been devastating for themselves and their families. It's resulted in people feeling that they have to leave the city, leave their employment, hide it from their partners and family and work, even changing their names to hide. For some, they've carried this up uh, to 32 years. And he ends by saying, uh, but what we've shown is that nobody is above the law. So I'm going to say, what a fantastic policeman to stay on this case. I'm also going to add that although there's a lot more I'd like to comment, we know that uh, uh, Charles Housen is currently putting in an appeal against his sentence and therefore to be prudent, uh, we're going to be very measured in what we say until that appeal uh, hearing has taken place. Um, but nevertheless, a sentence of seven and a half years, so he should spend at least half of that mm. in prison. 
And uh, before we leave the subject, I think this is a very important uh, headline for us at least, that we've got to remember that this man's offending was absolutely encouraged by a blatant cover up by the Royal Navy and another charity, the Groundwork Trust that he was working for. So the Royal Navy did not take um, the proper procedures. In fact, uh, one of the senior officers who said he was part of a censuring or should have been part of a censuring of Charles House and following an offence on board the frigate HMS Cleopatra uh, was later recalled into court uh, because he, he had forgotten to say that he was the man who should have written the letter. Mm. And uh, the charity, the Groundwork Trust, knew what had happened, knew the testimony of the, the victims of those attacks, uh, but decided they wouldn't go to the police and Charles Housen was simply released. So we just remind people, of course, it was the UK column that printed the story on the abuse of children at Oxford and Sherwell Valley College. Uh, we were alone in warning what was going on here. And um, Prince Andrew had a visit to the college, indeed the very workshop where some of the worst abuses had taken place, even when we telephoned uh, his personal aide to say to him that there's something nasty going on at the college. Very interesting to see here that uh, in 2002, a gentleman had requested freedom of information response asking for the correspondence to do with that visit by the Duke of York to Blackbird Lays campus, that is the OCVC camp, uh, campus. And um, I was intrigued to see here, Mike, that uh, um, they redacted who the email had come from originally. So the college has got nothing to hide, but nobody wants to admit to dealing with the royal family. And of course, we pointed out at the time that the cover-up included three key women. Um, so we had um, Sally Dicketts, the uh, uh, head of Oxford Cherwell Valley College. Uh, we had Sarah Thornton, uh, obviously the lady in the police uniform as the head of, of uh, Thames Valley Police, and uh, Joanna Simmons, who was the chief executive of Oxford uh, Council. All of these women were common purpose leaders uh, and they were all rewarded or had been rewarded by the palace for their good works with medals. So astonishing that all these people can be connected to the palace, but despite all of that security around the royal family, nobody knows, Mike. And uh, just so that we remember, um, again, it was the uh, UK column that asked the key question, who nominated Jimmy Savile for his knighthood? And nobody wanted to reply to that uh, question. And I think I'm correct in saying that nobody to this date has replied. If anybody has got further information on this, we'd love to know. And I'll end the segment by saying that just remarkable that on Saturday was the Fresh Start talk uh, in Aberdeen. And uh, the Fresh Start team had two venues cancelled at the last moment. So my question is, were those venues warned off or were they actually part of the overall cover up of child abuse in Scotland themselves? It's uh, fascinating to watch this lot break surface. Yes. So, um, well, the Electoral Commission has been busy today. Uh, they have uh, released a press release saying urgent improvements needed to ensure transparency for voters in the digital age. Uh, and uh, well, this is really about Brexit in some ways, uh, Brian, because uh, they're calling for urgent reforms to electoral law. Uh, apparently after a, what, what are being described in the mainstream media as a series of online political campaign scandals. Uh, this, uh, for example, involves the scandal with Cambridge Analytica. Uh, and they're particularly concerned about the types of advertising uh, and, and promotional material that's appearing online. Uh, so they have called for a change in the law to require all digital political campaign material to state who paid for it, uh, bringing online adverts obviously in line with uh, public printed material and leaflets and so on. They want uh, new legislation to make it clear that spending in UK elections and referenda uh, by foreign organisations and individuals is not allowed. Uh, they want to increase the maximum fine, which is at the moment twenty uh, £20,000 per offence. Uh, so they want to be able to impose more. Uh, they want tougher requirements uh, for political campaign campaigns to declare uh, spending soon after or during a campaign rather than much later. 
uh, and they uh, want all campaigners to provide more detailed paperwork on how they spend money online. Uh, they said urgent action must be taken by the UK's governments to ensure, uh, you notice it's the UK's governments, uh, anyway, to ensure that uh, the tools uh, used to regulate political campaigning online continue to be fit for purchase. Pur in a digital age. Implementing our package of recommendations will significantly increase transparency about who is seeking to influence voters online uh, and the money spent on this at UK elections and referenda. Uh, and uh, well, they're particularly interested in Facebook as well, so they want to see who's spending money on Facebook. Uh, I would imagine all leads all roads lead back to Russia uh, on this one. This Almost certainly. Probably what's going on here. Yeah, and I'll just add that apparently, according to our chat box, um, Russia is buying up cocktail sticks. Really? Uh, uh, apparently so. These are going to be used, of course, to deflate the blow-up tanks. Good stuff. Excellent. That's impressive. Uh, okay, here's Public Health England. Now, of course, Public Health England uh, knows lots about Novichok and, and uh, the best way to deal with it, which is, of course, baby wipes. Uh, but in this case, they have uh, published uh, a survey which they say that reveals women experience severe reproductive health issues. Now, I would have thought that if uh, women were experiencing uh, severe reproductive health issues that they would be sad. Uh, but in fact, the image that goes along this with this is a group of women all beaming with big wide smiles. So they're clearly extremely happy that they're uh, experiencing severe reproductive health issues. So there's a bit of a psychological uh, operation going on with this article in my opinion but anyway that's just my opinion I noticed when the BBC uh, covered Excuse this it's okay when the BBC covered this article their headline was uh, that uh, uh, lots of under 25s are not enjoying sex uh, now you may well ask uh, why what the, why the two different uh, articles uh, why the diff two different headlines uh, the reason is that uh, one of the things that uh, the Public Health England is focusing uh, saying is that in order to have good reproductive health uh, probably good sex is a part of that. Now, uh, that doesn't matter. The key point is that the Public Health England's focus is on reproductive health and particularly the ability to have children, whereas the BBC decided it's probably better not to focus on that particular aspect, and I wonder why. So the, what they're saying is here that 7,300 women surveyed uh, and that uh, a, a large proportion of them uh, are struggling to conceive. They're having uh, reproductive health issues. Uh, and uh, this piece of work done by Public Health Issue, uh, Public Health England, sorry, uh, launched after Dame Sally Davies, who's the uh, chief medical officer, uh, called uh, for the increase of awareness, dissemination of information and person-centered care around reproductive health in a report she issued in 2014. Now, at this point, Brian, I just wanted to remind everybody uh, of uh, some comments that Barry Troer made in an interview you did with him. I believe it was in 2013. Uh, and uh, well, let's have a listen to what he said. Last April, I had a phone call from the Irish Doctors Environmental Association. And they said, would you address our annual conference in Dublin? And we want one specific thing that we want you to talk about and only that they said don't go into anything else don't go into tetra don't go into the effect on the planet nothing at all just this and i said okay what is it and they said we want you to talk about the effect of low level microwave irradiation on the ovarian follicles of schoolgirls and i said Fine, I can do that. I prepared my talk. <clears throat> I gave it on early Saturday afternoon in Dublin to the Irish doctors. They asked questions during the afternoon. They block booked a restaurant and I was faced questions on this Saturday evening. They asked me to come back on the Sunday and I, I had further questions just to do with this from, from the doctors. I had further questions uh, from 11 o'clock Sunday morning to 4 o'clock Sunday afternoon when I had to leave to come back to get my plane. So I was questioned all Saturday afternoon, Saturday evening, Sunday. I say this because with all the different disciplines the research which I had 
stood its ground. Now Barry Troyer went on to, to because it, a, a significant part of that interview was about the issue of microwave radiation and uh, the uh, the effect that it has on on young ch teenage girls and their potential ability to have children subsequently and whether yeah. those children are going to be subject to birth defects. And he's talking about Wi-Fi in schools. He's talking about uh, uh, microwave uh, transmissions as well as mobile phone technology and so on. Uh, uh, this is an area where. Uh, the research which is already published is being uh, pretty much suppressed um, and uh, and much more research needs to be done. I'm going to show that full interview immediately after this uh, after this program if anybody wants to watch it. But the point here is that Public Health England has published a, docu uh, a report uh, describing a pretty significant number of people uh, who are having reproductive health issues uh, and uh, this uh, subject is not being uh, discussed publicly in the mainstream press or amongst politicians no. or amongst amongst or from Public Health England in fact uh, and so I'm just putting this out uh, to make a suggestion that perhaps this is a subject that should be discussed and we should be looking quite seriously at it. Particularly as 5G is on the horizon. Well, well in, fa in, fact, in fact towards the end of that interview which if you remember uh, as I said uh, took I think we recorded that in 2013 uh, Barry Troer starts to, before 5G was ever mentioned. He's starting to talk about uh, phase modulation of, of uh, microwave uh, energy and what that has the potential to do. It's extremely interesting and extremely pertinent to what's going on with 5G. Yes, and we'll say if people do watch that video, p uh, please share the information with others. This is the whole point about getting it out there. Well, if the serious reality of uh, reproduction is not being told in the mainstream press and media. Um, we've got another attack going on young people and thank you very much to the viewer who uh, flagged up this one. Um, they basically seen, uh, seen information talking about transforming relationships and sexuality education. It said research involving children and young people on their experiences of gender and sexual violence has changed Welsh legislation, sparked youth activism on sexual injustice and violence and is reshaping relationships and sexual sexuality education in schools. So that's all quite a claim. Um, where did this lot come from? Uh, well, it's this organisation, uh, which is Economic and Social Research Council, Shaping Society. We're on to the sort of think tank issue here, uh, Mike, but this is really incredible stuff encourage people to go to the website and find this to have a look at the video but they want to shape society they want to shape uh, uh, shape society and um, you little embedded video there which is the key one to watch it's it's breathtaking um, in case you wonder the lady on the right in that picture is actually the professor so uh, this is a close-up of her this is professor Emil, emma reynolds and it's her policy, which is now working through young teenagers in schools and is becoming the formal policy of the Welsh government. So I don't know what goes on in this lady's mind. What I perceive from looking at the video and listening to what she has to say is I don't really like her agenda, but somehow she's powerful enough to get this agenda to be the agenda of the Welsh government. Um, so this is a bit of... Uh, information on what she's uh, got to talk about she said she has got um, uh, she's done extensive research on the role of education in preventing gender and sexual violence and this is where the uh, references the welsh government comes in uh, she's been a member of the welsh government's national uh, violence against women advisory group and she says that she's helped shape the This Is Me campaign to challenge harmful gender stereotypes. She's worked with 50 young people and they've produced the bilingual online toolkit Agenda, a young people's guide to making positive relationships matter. And in the first 12 months, that's gone out to 1,400 young people, 1,000 practitioners, 500 teachers and 100 academics. So one woman, Mike, has got this level of um, influence. 40 young people were trained as agenda youth ambassadors, some of these sharing the toolkit resource with the European network of ombudspersons for children and at the UN headquarters in New York. 
And the bit that caught my eye down the bottom here is that uh, Professor Reynold was chair of the Cabinet Secretary for Education's expert panel on the future of SRE um, in Wales and consultant to the new health and wellbeing curriculum. Uh, the new relationships and sexuality education, which will be statutory for five to 16 year olds, will be embedded in the curriculum and introduced in 2022. So my question is, who is this lady? Uh, what really goes on in her mind? Are her values the sorts of values that the average parent would want their children having or adopting? We don't know. But suddenly one woman has the power to influence the whole of the agenda in Wales. And this is how she does it in part, because she's into the schools, um, supposedly consulting with young people. But of course, what's going on here, Mike, is she's really putting the ideas in the heads of these children. This is brainwashing. It's very uh, smooth, but it's very sophisticated. She is putting the agenda in the heads of the children. They echo it back and then it becomes their point of view. So you can see from some of the images that I've captured that these are pretty young teenage girls. And um, this is one of the things that the professor thinks is helping to education. She is wearing a skirt of rulers and apparently the rulers are covered in graffiti, which might be sort of against women or against feminists or anything like that. And this really caught my eye. Uh, because we've got some comments on plates. So on the green one, it says teachers need to go on courses to learn about the new SRE curriculum in order to provide children with as much information on each topic as possible. Um, it's been written in a way that we're, we're led to believe a child has written that, Mike. I find this very interesting because I don't believe a child wrote this. I think an adult wrote it uh, trying to make it in a childish hand. And then it's on the red plate, it says top, stop teaching everything negatively. Um, we've got immature minds, and I mean that in an appropriate way. These are immature minds. They're being taught to challenge normality, and that is then forming government opinion in Wales. It's, it's very interesting. You, you, know, you didn't see yesterday's news programme, but we, we showed a little bit of video uh, with uh, Banna of Aleppo, the little girl from Aleppo that, that is commenting on uh, Syria. Uh, and uh, she was speaking clearly either having learned lines verbatim or having yep. uh, whether she had an earpiece in her ear that was prompting her, we don't know. But, but uh, you know, the language that she was using, the, the form of words, the sentences that she was coming out with were clearly not age appropriate. No. And, and that's similar to what we see here. Indeed. I, I, uh, some, of, some of our viewers have already said, well, this is nonsense. And I'm going to come back and say, no, this isn't nonsense because it is so dangerous. This is calculated policy. These are calculated applied psychological techniques being used on the children. This is very dangerous orchestrated brainwashing of the children. And uh, I was very curious that, uh, to see what had been written on the plates because going back many years ago, one of the ladies who'd had a very bad experience with training by common purpose uh, told me that part of her training weekend involved writing things on paper plates. And at the time she told me that, it seemed very strange as a game which people from uh, quite high level businesses would have been involved in. But we're now starting to see the technique mirrored here with mm -hmm. the children. Mm -hmm. We'll leave it there. Of course, children form the next generation. If you capture the minds of the children, then the policy is already in place for the future, which is why the government says that no child should be left behind. This is nothing to do with protecting children. This is to do with taking the minds of children to get that uh, communitarian uh, fascist state in place. We'll leave it there. Have a think about what we've shown you today. We'll be back at the same time tomorrow. Bye-bye.